All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. At Gates Brain Health, we deal with the gut brain connection, which is the topic of a lot of research. And many of you are inquisitive about this subject. So tonight I'm talking about the gut bacteria and liver disease. <clears throat> I will say, having worked with a lot of irritable bowel syndrome patients through the years, a fair number of inflammatory bowel disease patients like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, that I have seen a fair proportion of autoimmune hepatitis cases. And autoimmune hepatitis seems to have some association with deranged populations of gut bacteria. Now, uh, is that the only cause of autoimmune hepatitis? Probably not. But in the coming broadcast, I'm going to be discussing this link as well as probably going through fatty liver disease, which is super common, or maybe how your gut bacteria connect to cirrhosis. As diabetes and prediabetes become increasingly more common, um, we're probably going to see much more fatty liver disease and other conditions like hepatic encephalopathy result from the changes in the microbiome of our current society. So good evening to everyone who's joining. And without further ado, I will start the broadcast. I always mess that up. Okay, so the gut bacteria and a liver disease. And I'm going to hide that guy. So this is a diagram from Dr. Chiha, that's how you technically pronounce his name. I've been referring to him as Dr. Sezaha, but you pronounce his name Dr. Chiha. And Dr. Chiha uh, is pretty much the world's foremost uh, author and researcher on autoimmune hepatitis, in my opinion. Uh, he has been around for a number of years. I believe he's been in practice since 1968 when I read his biography. He did a lot of his work at the Mayo Clinic. He had particular interest in uh, autoimmune hepatitis. And the cool thing is when you follow one of these doctors is that you get to see how someone has gone through and not only been a, a witness, but also an, an advocate for condition. Because you have to keep in mind that uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C were not even fully understood for a number of years that you would probably think were semi-recent decades. So he goes through how in the past, doctors were trying to decipher between, was this autoimmune hepatitis? Was this some other infection? As they learned more and more about hepatitis B and hepatitis C, there still seemed to be this other condition referred to as autoimmune hepatitis. It used to be referred to as lupoid hepatitis, I believe, because they saw some overlap with systemic lupus erythematosus. SLE as you would know it. And so uh, he's just, he's a great reference to read. Uh, for those of you who are interested, check out his articles on PubMed. Here's the spelling of his name. And later in his career, from what I could discern, is that he did a lot of research on the association between the microbiome and autoimmune hepatitis. Autoimmune hepatitis being this condition where the immune system is literally attacking the liver. And so uh, in this, this article titled, titled Factoring the Intestinal Microbiome into the Pathogenesis of Autoimmune Hepatitis, uh, he talks about the mainstay treatments for autoimmune hepatitis, which include uh, steroids and azothioprine. But he also says, if we pay attention to this microbiome, we may be able to complement those treatments. And so uh, I will be presenting much more of his research as I go through this. I just wanted to attach this figure from this article just to kind of give you a general overview of what I will be discussing. And again, good evening to everyone who's joining. I should probably type that in. Good evening. So with that being said, here you see your liver. That's the diagram there. Here we have a diagram of the intestinal microbiome. 
important things to pay attention to include these things called TLRs, standing for toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors help your immune system to know uh, if there are inflammatory antigens, so to speak, coming into the intestine, coming into the liver. And particularly, toll-like receptor 4 is stimulated by bacterial antigens from the gut, namely pieces of bacteria referred to as endotoxin, also known as lipopolysaccharide, which those of you who watch my videos, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you who, who do not watch my videos regularly, uh, lipopolysaccharide, for all intents and purposes, are like little tails on gram-negative bacteria. We seem to get a disproportionate... Uh, absorption of these tails, referred to as lipopolysaccharide, and a number of autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, and autoimmune hepatitis is, is not unique in that. Where these, these endotoxins are absorbed, they bind to toll-like receptors, and they seem to initiate these inflammatory pathways, which is what I'm I'm highlighting here with my mouse. And when there seems to be an overabundance of endotoxin absorbed and these toll-like receptors are stimulated, then we can have different differentiation of our T helper cells potentially into inflammatory subsets that then may trigger autoimmune disease. And I guess just to take a step back, we have to all of this we're talking about because it seems that inflammatory disorders, autoimmune disorders are on the rise. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, diabetes and prediabetes are super common. How common are they? Like 10% of the American population has diabetes. Um, about a third of the American population has prediabetes. And it's anticipated that this huge proportion of prediabetics, likely a large percentage of them will transition into diabetes. And we have all these concerns about, you know, that two-thirds of Americans are going to be obese by 2032. And a lot of these effects are stemming from changes in the microbial architecture of the gut. Think of a field, maybe the human microbiome in the 1940s or 30s looked like a beautiful grassy meadow with nice flowers. And now the metaphor would be that our microbiome looks like a field of weeds. And we don't really know why. We might be too clean in our living. We might not be exposed to enough parasites. Maybe we're just not out in the dirt enough. I mean, how many of us are sitting in an office rather than hiking through the forest or, you know, have our hands in the dirt? And then also antibiotic therapies, other immune therapies that are being given, you know, to all of us to prevent diseases. It's thought that this clean hypothesis is predisposing us to these inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. I think there's a book called Eat Dirt by Danielle Rubish. She's an immunologist, and that's a good read for any of you who are interested in the topic. Nonetheless, after that huge digression, uh, we're looking at this just to see that endotoxin from the intestines binds to these toll-like receptors, and if it's excessive, it can be involved in the pathogenesis, theoretically, of autoimmune hepatitis. That is what Dr. Chiha is showing. So I'm gonna hide this and I'm gonna show this on stream. So this is along that line, an article from China where they said the fecal microbiomes distinguish patients with autoimmune hepatitis from healthy individuals. So we see that the microbiome populations of autoimmune hepatitis is different from healthy controls. For those of you who like to scrutinize studies, you'll say, well, there's not that many people here, only 37 autoimmune hepatitis patients. What we have to realize is that autoimmune hepatitis is really not that common. Um, at least it's not, it doesn't have a prevalence of being that common. I oftentimes wonder if it is more common uh, than what we think it is, but we're just not diagnosing it well enough and the tests are not run often enough. Nonetheless, the other problem is, is that when you're doing a study on autoimmune hepatitis, you want to study individuals who are not yet on prednisone or budesonide or azathioprine. So we want treatment-naive autoimmune hepatitis patients preferentially if we're going to study their gut bacteria 
versus those who are normal. And so given that it's really not that common of a condition, when you look at the studies on autoimmune hepatitis, you're not gonna see huge sample sizes most typically. So we have that. And then here is another article. Da, da, da. Yeah, this is another article confirming the same thing uh, in patients in Egypt, and they said significantly lower bacterial diversity in autoimmune hepatitis patients was found compared to controls. So we're gonna XNA this guy again, and I'll flip it around. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close tonight with this diagram because again, tonight is an introduction to the gut bacteria and liver diseases. Uh, I'm using autoimmune hepatitis as a template tonight, but I will be talking in the coming weeks about fatty liver. You probably know someone with fatty liver. We'll also talk about liver cirrhosis because anytime liver enzymes pop up high on a lab test, the person immediately th is thinking, you know, is my liver cirrhotic? So we'll talk about those associations. Nonetheless, the take home point is that autoimmune hepatitis uh, is a condition that has basically an association with deranged gut bacteria. Other studies, which I haven't even mentioned tonight, are that it seems that the tight junction proteins are reduced in autoimmune hepatitis patients compared to healthy controls. Tight junction proteins are the proteins that keep each intestinal epithelial cell together. And so those may be reduced in autoimmune hepatitis also. And it is thought that these bacterial components that are absorbed that bind to these toll-like receptors are what are stimulating the exact immune reaction in autoimmune hepatitis. That's the theory. So that's it. Send me your questions. Uh, hoping to be back more often with more videos, uh, not only this week, but in the coming weeks. If you have anything you want me to talk about, let me know and we will go from there. All right, everyone. Have a lovely evening.